Well, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Face to Face Conversations with God. It's your girl Chantel, and it is time for us to dive in into the Word of the Lord. As you can see, I'm having computer problems over here. Okay, there we go. All right. Should have waited a few minutes before I got on live to figure out what was going on with that computer. But at any rate, we are on. All right, so today we're going to start the book of Timothy. We're going back to the New Testament. We're reading first uh, Timothy. Uh, we're, there's only six chapters, but we're going to read chapters one through three today, and we'll do uh, four, five, and six on tomorrow. All right? So let me share this broadcast. Do, 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 do. I pray everyone is having a wonderful day. All right. Today we're going to be reading from the Passion Translation. All right. Uh, we're going to be reading from the Passion Translation. All right. Make sure there's no typos. And we're ready to go. All right. So I want to welcome everybody back to Face to Face Conversations with God. It's your girl, Chantel, and it is time for us to dive into a new book. We have just completed our 56th book which means we only have 10 more books to go and we would have completed reading the entire Bible. I don't know about you, but I know that my life has been transformed. It's being changed. It's being remolded. It doesn't matter how many times you read the entire Bible, you will gain something new every time you sit down to read. How is that so? Because the Bible is alive and God begins to reveal more of himself to us as we dive into the word, okay? So today, we're going to get started in the New Testament with the book of First Timothy, okay? We're going to be reading from the Passion Translation. Now, I'm going to be honest with you all. I really wanted to read it from the complete Jewish Bible, but it might throw some of you all off because... It doesn't call the names like we're used to them being called. And, um, you know, there's Jewish terminology in there that might throw some people off. They'd be like, what is she doing? She's a heretic. No, you just need to read the Bible from different versions. It will bless you. If you have the Bible app, go down where, it, uh, where you can pick the versions and read it from the complete Jewish Bible. It's the CJB Bible. It blessed me. <laughs> All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to do, uh, do my overview like I always do whenever we start a new book. And then we're going to go straight into Timothy. We won't be on long because we're only reading three chapters. We'll probably be finished in about 30 to 45 minutes. All right. Okay. Uh, Father, we come before you thanking you for this opportunity to read your word together. We thank you for how you're pouring out of your spirit into us. We thank you, hallelujah, that you're writing your word on the tables of our heart so that we can grow in wisdom, we can grow in understanding, and we can walk in knowledge. We thank you for this, Lord God. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are seated at the right hand of the Father and you are making intercession for us daily. Hallelujah. 
We thank you that even when we don't know what to pray for ourselves, you are making intercession. When we can't seem to open up our mouth and push forth the prayer, you and Holy Spirit are making intercession for us. We thank you for this, Lord Jesus. We thank you that because of your act of kindness, your act of mercy, your act of grace, we have the ability and the right to come before the Father and to speak with him and to make our requests known and to just praise and honor him and to just lay at his feet and say, Father, we love you. Father, we thank you. It's you that opened up that door. Hallelujah. We saw in the Old Testament where they had to go through the priest. But when you came, Christ Jesus, you tore the veil and you said you no longer need anybody to come before you to talk to the Father. Jesus, you opened up that door so we could come in and talk to the Father ourselves. We are so grateful for that. Hallelujah. We don't have to wait until a certain day or make an appointment to uh, let somebody hear what we want to say to the Father. We can go to you in our prayer closet, in our secret chamber, and we can talk to you. And you hear us and you answer our prayers. Hallelujah. You send encouragement. You send instructions. You send faith. You build us up. You strengthen us. You even correct us when correction is needed. Hallelujah. But you, most of all, you let us know how much you love us. You love us so much, it will blow our minds as you begin to pour out your love into us. We thank you that you love us right where we are. You understand who we are. We are but dust. It doesn't give us the, the right to sin against you. It doesn't give us to go all willy-nilly and do whatever we want. But when we miss the mark, when we sin against you, you still love us. And you say, come on back. Come on back. I'm going to love you in spite of what is going on in your life. In spite of how you're acting towards my word, I still love you. So we thank you for this love that is so undying. It, it, it searches us out. It runs us over and says, hey, boom, I love you. Hallelujah. We thank you. Lord. Knock us out with your love, Father. Cause us to bow to our knees because of the love that you keep showing to us continually. And may that love drive us to you. May that love cause us to fall in love with you. Hallelujah. A love that we don't have to pay for, a love that will not hurt us, a love that will not abuse us, a love that will not talk about us, a love that will not gossip about us, a love that will not spread slanderous words about us, but a love that encourages, a love that heals, a love that sets us up straight and causes us to stand tall. A love that causes us to walk in confidence. We thank you for this love, dear God. And then, Holy Spirit, we come asking you to invade our lives, invade our thought life, invade our prayer life, invade our natural walking days. Everything that we do, invade it. Invade us on our job. Invade us in our families. Invade us on our telephone conversations. Cause us to be quick to stop when we're ready to gossip, quick to stop when we're ready to spread a rumor, quick to stop when we're ready to be angry about a deal or a situation or a circumstance. Cause our mouth to have a guard over it. Ooh, Jesus, that's a good one, Holy Spirit. Cause there to be a guard over the gates of our mouth that our tongue only speaks what is good, what is pure, what is holy, what uplifts. And if there be any correction, may it be correction with love, not out of hate and spite, but with love. So Father, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, soften our hearts where it's been hard and crusty and nothing can grow there. Thank you that you're pouring the water of the word on our hearts and it's softening us. And we're enlarging our capacity to receive from you, Holy Spirit. We thank you that you are the spirit of truth. We thank you for a teachable spirit. We thank you that we will retain what you show us. 
We thank you that we are good ground. We are solid ground that can receive the seed of the word and it is growing and flourishing in our lives. And we're deeply planted by the river brook, deeply planted by the streams of water that flow and give life and give strength and give love and give encouragement. We thank you that our roots go deep in God. Hallelujah. And we get our nourishment from him. In the precious, holy, righteous, supreme, strong name of Jesus, saving name of Jesus, healing name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord God. Amen. All right. So we are going to get started with the book of First Timothy from the Passion Translation. Okay. The book of Timothy is known as the, well, it's uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. They are known as the pastoral epistles. If you're a pastor, you are very well acquainted with these books, okay? So this is what's going on. Paul is preparing to pass his torch, his ministry to others. In those, in these letters that he has written, we will see the advice he's giving to the up and coming leaders, to those that are gonna continue to walk in the power of the resurrection of Christ. Timothy's mother was Jewish and uh, she became a believer, all right? And if I'm not mistaken, his father was Greek. If I'm not mistaken, I think I read that his father was Greek. Not only did his mother instruct him in the scriptures, but his grandmother also instructed him in the scriptures. Paul was instrumental in Timothy's conversion. Whose life are you in instrumental in? Have you, have you invited anybody to come to know Jesus since you've been saved? Oh, 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 okay. Well, why are you waiting? What you waiting for? Oh, okay, let's keep going. Timothy went on missionary journeys with Paul and Silas. So you know he saw a lot, he learned a lot, he soaked in a lot because God was acquainted with Paul. God did mighty works through Paul. So Timothy was right there with him as he was moving in the things of God. Timothy even followed the same uh, line as, as Paul. He was arrested. So we're going to see some similarities also. All right. So that's a little brief overview of the book of Timothy. You can go do some research and dig deeper if you want to know more about Timothy. All right. So Timothy chapter first Timothy chapter one from the passion translation introduction uh first it says heaven's truth and that was the title that was the description that i wanted to use today from paul an apostle in christ jesus for it was jesus himself our living hope who sent me as his servant by the command of god our life giver i like the way it says it in um the complete Jewish Bible. Let me just read that. From Shual, our emissary of Messiah Yeshua, uh, Yeshua, by command of God, our deliverer, the Messiah, Yeshua, our hope. It's Christ that is our hope. It's not a man or a woman. It's Christ that's our hope. Verse two, Timothy, you are my true spiritual son in faith. May abundant grace mercy, and total well-being from God the Father, and the anointed one, our Lord Jesus, be yours. Timothy's ministry in Ephesus. As I urge you when I left for Macedonia, I'm asking that you remain in Ephesus to instruct them not to teach or follow the error of deceptive doctrines. Same word is for us today. Do not follow the teachings of deceptive doctrines, nor pay any attention to cultural myths, traditions, or endless study of genealogies. You hear that? All right. I'm going to read that part again. 
<laughs> Instruct them not to teach or follow the error of any deceptive doctrines, nor pay any attention to cultural myths, traditions, or the endless study of genealogies. Those digressions only breed controversies and debates. You don't have to debate the word of God. If you come on this page and you want to have a debate, you notice I don't even uh, answer you. I don't even get involved in it because your mind is already set. <laughs> don't even get involved with endless debates. They are devoid of power that builds up and strengthens the church in the faith of God. Debates don't have any power to build you up and to strengthen you. Four, we reach the goal of fulfilling all the commandments when we love others deeply with a pure heart, a clean conscience, and sincere faith. Some believers have been led astray by teachings and speculations that emphasize nothing more than the empty words of men. God, may we not be a people that are full of empty words. May our words be full of the spirit of God and the fire of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. They presume to be expert teachers of the law, but they don't have the slightest idea of what they're talking about, and they simply love to argue. My God. First uh, Timothy chapter one, verse eight from the, uh, the Passion Translation. We know that the moral code of the law is beautiful when applied as God intended. But actually, the law was not established for righteous people. Listen, listen. Those of you that say you live by the law, listen to why it was established. <laughs> that part again. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. But actually, the law was not established for righteous people, but to bring our but to bring conviction of sin to the unrighteous. The law was established to bring the revelation of sin to evildoers and rebellious, the sinners without God, those who are vicious and perverse, and to those who strike their father or their mother, sinners, murderers, rapists, those who are sexually impure, homosexuals, kidnappers, liars, those who break their oaths, and all those who oppose the teaching of godliness and purity in the church. They are the ones the law is for. Whew. Now you understand why Christ said you don't live by the law. You live under grace and we walk under the love of God, all right? Verse 11, I have been commissioned to preach the wonderful news of the glory of the exalted God. My heart spills over with thanks to God for the way he continually empowers me. And to our Lord Jesus, the anointed one, who found me trustworthy and who authorized me to be his partner in this ministry. We are partners with God. Isn't that beautiful? Empowering mercy. First Timothy chapter one, verse 13. Mercy kissed me, even though I used to be a blasphemer, a persecutor of believers, and a scorner of what turned out to be true. I was ignorant and I didn't know what I was doing. I was flooded with such incredible grace, like a river overflowing its banks until I was full of faith and love for Jesus, the anointed one. 
I can testify that the word is true and deserves to be received by all. For Jesus Christ came into the world to bring sinners back to life, even me, the worst sinner of all. Yet I was captured by grace so that Jesus Christ could display through me the outpouring of his spirit as a pattern to be seen for all those who would believe in him for eternal life. Because of this, my praises rise to the king of all the universe who is indestructible, invisible, and full of glory, the only God who is worthy of the highest honors throughout all time and throughout the eternity of eternities. Amen. Paul encourages Timothy to remain faithful. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, the Passion Translation. So Timothy, my son, I am entrusting you with this responsibility in keeping with the very first prophecies that were spoken over your life and are now in the process of fulfillment in this great work of ministry in keeping with the prophecies spoken over you. With this encouragement, use your prophecies as weapons as you wage spiritual warfare by faith and with a clean conscience. What has God spoken over your life? Those are weapons to use for you to fight through, to battle through, to push through those obstacles that come in your way. For there are many who reject these virtues and are now destitute of the true faith, such as Hymenaeus and Alexander, who have fallen away. I have delivered them both over to Satan to be rid of them and to teach them to no longer blaspheme. First Timothy chapter 2, Instructions on Prayer. Most of all, I'm writing to encourage you to pray with gratitude to God. Pray for all men with all forms of prayer and request as you intercede with intense passion. And pray, listen, and pray for every political leader and representative so that we would be able to live tranquil, undisturbed lives as we worship the awe-inspiring God with pure hearts. It is pleasing to our Savior God to pray for them. Even if you don't like your representatives, even if you don't like your presidents, even if you don't like your governors or those that are in leadership, your bosses, you don't have to like them to pray that God would steer their decisions, that they would walk under the will of God, that they would have grace and mercy towards people. I know some of you walk, work for very hard leaders, but pray for them. Don't stop praying that God would touch their hearts, all right? He longs, he longs for everyone to embrace his life and return to the full knowledge of truth. For God is one, and there is one mediator between God and the sons of men the true man, Jesus, the anointed one. It's Jesus that mediates for you and I, all right? He gave himself as, as a ransom payment for everyone, not only just you and your family, your four and no more, but for everyone, even the murderers and, and, and the rapists and, and the uh, 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 people that uh, rob people and, and they're in jail. And they're, 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 they're thinking that God doesn't love them. God became ransom for everyone. No matter what the sin is, no matter where you are right now, whether you're free but locked up in the cages of your mind or whether you're in prison and locked up in the cages of your mind, God came to set all of us free. He ransomed all of us. But now you have to receive the gift, all right? 
He gave himself as ransom payment for everyone. Now is the proper time for God to give the world this witness. Listen, I want to go back and I want to read in the complete Jewish Bible, verse 5 and 6 and 7 to you all. Well, I'm going to read verse 5 and 6. Okay, I'm going to read 7. It's going to mention a word, but it is a Jewish word, okay? For God is one, and there is one, and there is but one mediator between God and humanity, Yeshua, the Messiah, himself, human, who gave himself as a ransom on the behalf of us all, thus providing testimony to God's purpose at just the right time. This is why I myself was appointed a proclaimer, even an emissary. I'm telling the truth, not lying. A trustworthy and truthful teacher of the Goyim. Those are, and this is why I didn't want to read it in that, but I want y'all, please, if you have the Holy Bible uh, 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 app, go and do the drop down menu and read this, this whole book from the complete Jewish Bible. It will really bless you. Okay. So now we're going back over to the Passion Translation, uh, verse seven. Yeah, verse seven. I have been divinely called as an apostle to preach this revelation, which is the truth. God has called me to be a trustworthy teacher to the nations. Verse eight. Therefore, I encourage the men to pray over every occasion with hands lifted to God in worship, with clean hearts, free from frustration or strife. Conduct of women. And many of you all really do need to go and do uh, studies on why Paul wrote what he wrote about the women. You have to remember these are people that are coming in from all kinds of lifestyles. and there were certain things that were indicative to that particular culture. We don't live in that culture. You and I do not live in that culture. All right. It's always, you must always go back and study the culture of the people. All right. And that the women, uh, verse nine, and that the women would also pray with clean hearts, dressed appropriately and adorn modestly and sensibly, not flaunting their wealth. Remember, these people were very wealthy. And then in some instances when he was writing, these were uh, people that were maybe in a, their lifestyle was very different. They, uh, some were prostitutes, ex-prostitutes, and now they're coming in and they're bringing their old ways, their old world thinking into the church, trying to do the same thing. This is, same problem we have right now. Same. Okay, let me keep reading. Verse 10. But they should be recognized instead by their beautiful deeds of kindness, suitable as one who worships God. Let the women who are new converts be willing to learn with all submission to their leaders and not speak out of turn. <laughs> I don't advocate that newly converted women be teachers in the church, assuming authority over men, but, but to live in peace. We'll read that part again, because when it, and it means men too. When you are first born into Christ, there's so much that I know you're alive and, and, and you just see things so differently now, but there's a lot that God has to pour into you and teach you. Listen to what it says. I don't advocate that newly converted women be the teachers in the church, assuming authority over men, but to live in peace. Newly converted. Newly converted. One more time. Newly converted. For God formed Adam first, then Eve. Adam did not mislead Eve, but Eve 
misled him and violated the command of God. Yet a woman shall live and restore dignity by means of her children, receiving the blessing that comes from raising them up as consecrated children, nurtured in faith and love, walking in wisdom. And our last chapter for the day, 1 Timothy chapter 3 uh, from the Passion Translation. Leaders in the church. Leaders in the church. Listen, if any of you aspire to be an overseer in the church, you have set your heart toward a noble ambition. For the word is true. Yet an elder needs to be one who is without blame before others. He should be one whose heart is for his wife alone and not another woman. He should recognize, he should be recognized as one who is sensible and well behaved and living a disciplined life. If you don't have a disciplined life, how can you share the love and the disciplines of God? Come on, guys. We got to get it together. For all of you all that have gone out there and gotten your bishopry and your archbishopry and your apostle title and your pastor title and your master prophet, master teacher, master uh, apostle, master, 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 ma whatever, you bought it off the internet and God didn't call you to this. Look, this is not a road that's easy to walk down. God has to call you into leadership. He, he builds you for leadership. But you got to fall in line with his structure, not with what you want to do. You can't be a leader of a church just because your ideas got thrown down. Now you're going to go start your own church somewhere. That's not how any of this works. It's not how any of it works. All right, let's keep reading. He should be a spiritual shepherd who has the gift of teaching and is known for his hospitality. He cannot be a drunkard or someone who lashes out at others or argumentative or someone who simply craves more money. But instead, he, he is recognized by his gentleness. His heart should be set on guiding his household with wisdom and dignity, bringing up his children to worship with devotion and purity. For if he's unable, listen, for if he's unable to properly lead his own household well, how could he properly lead God's household? You see this look on my face? All right. I didn't say it. It's the Bibles with the S. He should not be a new disciple who would be vulnerable to living in the clouds of conceit and fall into pride, making him easy prey for Satan. I'm going to read it again. Just like the women. He's saying, if you're newly converted, this is not the office for you yet. It's not that God has not called you to it, but you're not ready yet, all right? He should not be a new disciple who would be vulnerable to living in the clouds of conceit and fall into pride, making him easy prey for Satan. This is God's arm of protection speaking through Paul. He should be respected by those who are unbelievers, having a beautiful testimony among them so that he will not fall into the traps of Satan and be disgraced. Verse 8. And in the same way, the deacons must be those who are pure and true to their word, not addicted to wine or with greedy eyes on the contributions. Instead, they must faithfully embrace the mysteries of faith 
while keeping a clean conscience. And each of them must be found trustworthy according to these standards before they are given responsibility to minister as servant leaders without blame. Wow. These are the instructions from Paul to the newly leader to the new leaders that are coming forth. Paul knows that his ministry is coming to an end. Paul knows that his time on earth is limited. It's growing very short. So he's making sure that he writes out instructions and in both the women and the men, he says, do not use people who are newly converted. They're not ready yet. They haven't been built up in God yet. They're not able to see the tricks and the deception of the enemy yet. Yet, yet, yet. All right? Verse 11. And the women also who serve the church should be dignified, faithful in all things, having their thoughts set on truth and not known as those who gossip. A deacon's heart must be towards his wife alone, leading his children and household with excellence. For those who serve in this way will obtain an honorable reputation for themselves and a greater right to speak boldly in the faith that comes from the anointing of Jesus. I'm writing all this with the expectation of seeing you soon. But if I'm delayed in coming, you'll already have these instructions on how to conduct the affairs of the church of the living God. His very household and the supporting pillar and firm foundation of the truth. The mystery of righteousness. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 from the passion translation for the mystery of righteousness is truly amazing he was revealed as a human being and as our great high priest in the spirit angels gazed upon him as a man and the glorious message of his kingly rulership is being preached to the nations many have believed in him and he has been taken back to heaven and has ascended into the place of exalted glory in the heavenly realm. Yes, great is the mystery of righteousness. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the reading of 1 Timothy chapters 1 through 3. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you will continue to minister the truth of this word to our hearts so that we can continue to grow in faith walk strong in you, and be examples here in the land of your righteousness, of your love, of your mercy, and of your grace. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we thank you, dear God. Amen. All right, guys. Well, we have finished our reading on for today. We've read 1 Timothy chapters 1 through 3 from the Passion Translation. I love you all. Don't forget to hit the share button and we'll be back on here tomorrow, Lord willing, reading 1 Timothy chapters 4, 5, and 6. All right? Love you. See you next time. Bye-bye.